Th thank you. Thank you, Elena. <coughs> Welcome, everyone. Uh, as introduced, I will be uh, doing a workshop in here, uh, but you are able to follow the workshop alongside my talk. So if you go into my GitHub repository, and I hope that someone posted, yes, yeah, someone posted a link to the comments so you can open that, uh, you will be able to uh, launch the online uh, environment in your browser. If you if you hit the launch binder button on, in the repository, or if you prefer to work on your own local computer, you are free to download the notebook, but make sure that you have all the dependencies installed. That's all listed on the GitHub page. So, uh, and I would, if you are interested in following the code along my talk, I would recommend starting the binder now because it may take a minute or two before it starts. And I will give you time to uh, launch it and to find the way to my GitHub. Uh, and I will walk through a bit of introduction on the topic. So as introduced, I'm Martin Fleischmann. I am data scientist at the Geographic Data Science Lab at the University of Liverpool. And I'm also open source developer. So I am one of the maintainers of GeoPandas, which is uh, one of the fundamental libraries for geospatial data in Python. And I'm also developer of PySol, which is Python Spatial Analytics Library, which we will be using uh, throughout this workshop heavily. Uh, this was the wrong button. And we're going to talk about urban morphology, which means we're going to talk about uh, the arrangement of cities, because how do we arrange stuff in cities matters, and matters actually a lot. There's a lot of uh, academic research focusing on the density, focusing on the shapes, focusing on street networks, but there's also an increasing amount of policy documents which are focusing on the importance of the build-up patterns, either from perspective of beauty, as it's happening currently in the UK, from a perspective of urban sprawl, which is uh, predominantly American context, or also with a new urban agenda or uh, World Bank pro World Bank uh, projects, which are currently coming up and which are putting more and more emphasis on urban form. And when we speak about urban form, we essentially ask the question: What does it look like? What does the city look like? And by that, we mean the physical structure and appearance. We don't mean uh, people. We don't mean mobility. We just mean how that place is built, what, how big the buildings are, how they look like, how far they are away from each other, what is the street network connecting the place. So when we talk about urban morphology, which is the study of urban form, we talk about buildings. That's quite obvious, uh, obvious feature. We talk about streets. Again, one of the more straightforward ones. We talk about plots, which uh, is a spatial unit normally, which uh, is guiding the development of a place. So normally you first lay the layout of plots and the layout of plots influences how the buildings and streets look like. But you also can talk about open spaces. And the main question uh, which we will look into in this workshop is how can we describe it and how can we describe it numerically? So how can we measure thing, things? For that, there is a kind of subfield of uh, urban morphology, which is stretching from geography data science to architecture almost. And that's broken. <laughs> I'm sorry. This is the issue of running the live notebook as we speak, but I'll be back in a second. I'm sorry. What's going on in here? Yes. Okay. I'm sorry for this. So we talk about urban morphometrics, which is the quantitative analysis of urban form. Uh, 
which is everything about measuring those elements I have I've in, in, in introduced a few minutes before. And we can measure several things, several kind of groups of measurable characters, as we call it. We can measure dimensions, how our building's large, how streets are long, how plots are big, how what is the height of the building if you have the information on height. We can measure shapes, how complicated, how complex the shapes are, whether buildings look like a, a circle or whether they are more like a rectangle or elongated or square-like. We can talk about spatial distribution, which means how far buildings are from each other. For example, how wide the street is, which is defined by buildings, whether the buildings are aligned to street or whether the alignment of a building ignores the alignment of a street. We can uh, measure intensity, which is quite famously known density. Everyone is using density when talking about, about cities. And we will we will do one of the intensity one of the densities in here here as well. But density is very very wide term, and not uh, everything and not every density is the same density. Uh, we can talk about uh, connectivity, uh, which is mostly related to street networks, and we can also talk, talk about diversity. How diverse the places, uh, whether there are all buildings which are almost the same within the same place or whether we have small buildings right next to large ones. And why we want to do this? Because we essentially finally can, because we have the data we never had before. We have OpenStreetMap, which is not perfect by any means, but for a large portions of the world, it gives us uh, the coverage of street networks, and it also gives us the coverage of building footprints. And that's essentially the two input data we need. And we also have tools. So we have GeoPandas. I will talk in mostly about Python ecosystem because that's where I'm familiar with. We have GeoPandas, which can take care of uh, the spatial operations in a very performant way. We, we have PySAL, which can uh, look into the advanced spatial analytics so we can uncover those patterns. And we have MoonPy, which is a library I have uh, started writing uh, during my PhD a couple of years ago, which is currently part of the PySAL uh, family. And that is uh, the library we will work with today mostly. But first, a bit of introduction. GeoPandas is an open source project to add support for geographic data to Pandas objects. So if you are familiar with Pandas ecosystem, Pandas is a uh, Python library for tabular data. And uh, if you want to link uh, uh, geometries to each of the rows, that's what GeoPandas is for. So you can essentially uh, take your uh, workflow, which you are using in uh, ArcGIS, QGIS, and, and move it over to GeoPandas, and you will see the familiar data structures. Bicel is a Python spatial analysis library. It's a family of, uh, I think, about 15 or 16 libraries at the moment, uh, ranging from the fundamental uh, pieces for the spatial analytics, like spatial matrices, to really advanced uh, econometrics and the regionalization algorithms. And if you are doing anything, um, specialized, you will probably find that one of the PISA libraries can do that for you. And one of them is MomPy, which is a morphology measuring toolkit. And that's library, as the subtitle suggests, focused on measuring urban form and urban morphology. And this uh, workshop will walk you through the method to a very simplified version of a method which uh, uh, originated in a research paper and this is this is adapted figure for that paper from this paper uh, we will get input data streets and buildings from OpenStreetMap. we will generate uh, morphological tessellation which uh, is kind of a substitute of plot because as you can imagine OpenStreetMap doesn't have the information on plots we will kind of ignore the blocks in here we will measure morphometric characters. We will measure all those dimensions, shapes, distribution, densities. 
we will get uh, their contextual versions, which gives us an information on the tendency within each, uh, each space. And we will finish with uh, relatively straightforward clustering, which hopefully will uh, result in urban types of a case study we will, we will look at. All right, so let's start uh, coding. So I hope that those of you who want to code, you already have your binder opened or your notebooks ready. Uh, and we'll start with imports. As, as usual, I will import all the libraries we will need through notebook on the top. So we have gpandas, as I mentioned, we have libpycel and mompy, which are bits from the pycel family. Where Mumpy is the core of this of this of this workshop, and LibPyCell will take care of uh, special contiguity. We will use OSMNX, which is an amazing library by Jeff Boeing and others uh, to retrieve uh, data from OpenStreetMap within Python. And we will look at pandas uh, for some uh, joints. Uh, we will also work with Clustergram, which is another library I wrote uh, some time ago which will help us to understand how many clusters we will, we will want to use. But what essentially happens under the hood is standard k-means from scikit-learn. And for clustergram, we will also need uh, bokeh imports to get the interactive version of the clustergram diagram. And for plotting, we are also using matplotlib to get to get gpandas plots. So output notebook just loaded bokeh library, which we will need uh, later, and I hope it will work. So uh, what we are specifying here is a place we will work with, and it's its local projection. Uh, I'm going to work with Znoimo, uh, which is a town in my home country, Czechia. Uh, and I'm also specifying local projection because I know what the projection of, of, of Czech Republic is. But if you don't know the projection of your place, you can always use the local UTM zone. And we can geocode this place, this string, to get a point uh, with latitude, longitude, and check how the place looks like on the map. So this would be the point, the center of the, of the town. And what we can see here is that we have a town with very nicely formed historical medieval core. Then we have a bit of development around that, which seems to be from around 1900s, I would, I would say, nicely formed, relatively predictable perimeter blocks. We have a large uh, industrial area on the uh, east side of the city of the town and around that we have some small development of single family housing maybe just re just some it's not it's not maybe even residential housing but it may be also some uh, recreational zones and allotments and we have some smaller places around but i'm not entirely sure how big part of these places will be downloaded from OpenStreetMap. So what we need to do first is to download the data for Znoimo from OpenStreetMap. And if you are doing the same thing alongside me and you are changing your case study, make sure that when you explore the, the, the place, you see that there are buildings everywhere, that the coverage uh, of data in OpenStreetMap is actually good because in a lot of places around, you may find out that there are streets which are well-defined, well, well but buildings are missing. So that's, that wouldn't work within this, this, this workshop. And also make sure that the case study is relatively small because there are some limitations on my binder, on the online environment. And some steps also may take a while if you pick something like Las Vegas, for example. So, bing, bing, bing. Let's start with downloading buildings. We will use OSMNX geometries module 
and we uh, download geometries from place. We have defined a place above as a Znoimo in Czechia, and we will uh, download everything which uh, uh, has a tag building equal to true. That took a few seconds, and this is the data frame we got. So you can see that we have uh, about 12,000 buildings in here. We have a lot of information which is just missing. It's not relevant, so we will need to clean that so we don't have to carry it around. And also, you can start seeing that OpenStreetMap is not perfect, that some of the buildings are actually point geometries instead of polygons. And we need to, we need to do a bit of cleaning before we can, we can move on. So let's check the geometry types. We have 12,000 polygons and three points. So uh, let's remove points. Let's get only polygons. So we get the geometry type for each of them and make sure that it's equal to polygon. And we can also reset index because what we have here is it's not very useful for the for the use case we, have, we, will, we will be doing. And all those columns we have here, we, we, we won't find any reason to, to keep them especially if most of them are empty. So uh, I'm going to keep only the geometry column, and I will uh, reproject the all of them to my local uh, projection to have everything in meters and to have the high precision of the, of, of the analysis. And the final bit, which will we need for MumPy, is to assign unique identifier for each uh, geometry, each row. So we get just a simple range, and this is our cleaned uh, geodata frame where we have only polygon geometries, we have unique ident identifiers, and that's about it. So if you want to check how it looks like, we can have a, have a look what we have on the map to ensure that we have a good coverage. Yes, so this is our... These are our data. So we can see that this town in here, this this is village is out of the case study area, but some of those on the south and in here will be will be covered by the analysis. All right, let's do the same thing with with streets. We will again use uh, OSMNX and we get the drive network. We will use OSMNX to project the network to the local CR, local projection, and we will create uh, the Japan geodata frame from uh, OSM graph. So this is what we got. It's looking nice. It seems that most of the streets are nicely covered, and we shouldn't have any issue using this data set within MumPy. So, dun, dun, dun. but again, we have quite a lot of information which is not necessarily useful. And in my experience, what happens in some cases is that uh, street segments, which should be formed as a single line string from intersection to intersection, are sometimes split in, in, in multiple pieces. So we can do some pre-processing using MumPy to remove the, these false nodes to join the uh, line strings, which are not uh, encoding uh, any, uh, any, any intersection in between. And again, we will just filter geometry column, and we will make a unique identifier for our streets in the same way we did above. So we have, again, nice and clean uh, streets geo frame. That's all we can get from OpenStreetMap. So now we have to go towards uh, generation of another data. And we will start with tessellation because what we have now are building footprints and street network, but we are missing a spatial unit. We don't have anything which is covering the whole area spatially. So we will generate the cell, this, a tessellation. Uh, so given the building footprints, and this is just a tiny sample of building footprints, just for illustration, we can generate this uh, uh, Voronoi tessellation based on the building polygons 
to get something we call morphological tessellation. It's a concept which has appeared in little literature from about 2012. And we picked it up from Patrick Shermer from Urban Data Lab and uh, included it in, in MonPy. And since this step is essentially take uh, quite a lot of time, uh, let, let's start before I will uh, finish expl explanation. What do we hear in this uh, cell? We generate the limit of tessellation. So we buffer the whole, the, all, all buildings by let's say 100 meters in this case and say, okay, this is the edge of our case study area because as traditional Voronoi tessellation works, it can go to uh, infinity. And then we use MonPy tessellation uh, class to, and based on buildings, it's unique identifiers, our limit. We can generate uh, morphological tessellation for the whole case study area. And you can see that it's still running because what happens under the hood is that uh, every building polygon is segmentized and we are using one meter segment. So instead of a line around, we will have a, a series of points by every single meter that are used as an input of Voronoi tessellation and that's further dissolved back together to, to form the, the, the tessellation cells uh, based on polygons, not on individual points. And I hope it will finish soon. I'm also uh, turning off verbosity because some of the MonPy functions can give you an uh, indication of how the process goes, but it can be a slightly too verbose for, for presentation mode. So you will see that verbose false is appearing throughout the code. And we are done in here. And we got two warnings. Uh, one says that the selection does not fully match buildings and that the 23 elements collapsed and we have the IDs of those elements. And we also have another one that says that the selection contains multi-polygon elements. What this means is that the quality of open street map building data, which we are using, is suboptimal. And if you were doing, let's say, proper research paper, you would want to look into these IDs and clean them. It's quite likely that those are just some sliver geometries, some leftovers from changes within the OpenStreetMap. We don't have to care about it because the, the code is very fine with these issues and it will run anyway. But if we are using your own uh, case study for another purpose, make sure that you know why this happens and that uh, you are avoiding any issues with the data. So we have tessellation, and now we want also to understand which buildings belong to which streets. So we can do a uh, nearest spatial join. So we have the uh, uh, unique identifier of streets in here joined right now. But as you can see, there are some duplications in some cases that happens. Uh, in some cases, it, it, it's OK. It's expected. And you just pick one of those uh, joins. In other cases, it again means some duplication in the input data, which needs further, further cleaning. What we will do in here, we just drop the duplicates and we drop also the index right column because we don't, we don't we're not interested in that. And we link the same uh, network ID to the selection based on the unique identifier from, from buildings, which is shared between buildings and between the selection cells. So now it's time to actually start measuring. And we will start by measuring dimensions. And I will uh, do a trick because I'm not going to use MonPy to measure dimensions. I'm going to use GeoPandas. And we will measure just simple uh, areas of buildings, areas of tessellation cells, and length of streets. That's as simple as that. We can measure some more complex things with the MonPy. But uh, within this workshop, I'm just picking few uh, measurable characters for each category, just to give you a sense of what is possible and how you would do that within within Pycel ecosystem. So we can move quickly to shape. 
we will start with something which is called equivalent rectangular index, uh, which uh, essentially measures the complexity of a shape of, of buildings in this case. It measures the similarity of the shape of building to the rectangular of equivalent area. We can also measure elongation, uh, how elongated the building is. So we get the bounding box, the rotated bounding box, and we measure the elongation of it, the, the, the ratio between the longer and shorter side. We can also measure convexity, uh, essentially how similar the polygon is to its convex hole, whether it's super convex, which means the ratio is one, or whether it's not, it's more complex. And those are like polygon-based sh shape indicators for buildings and tessellation. And we can also measure linearity on streets, which is the ratio of the distance along the street segment to uh, distance between its endpoints, if you measure it as a straight line. So let's have a quick look into, into these measurements, how they look like on the map. So we have uh, equivalent rectangular index on the left side. We have elongation on the right side. You can see that there is a slight uh, pattern in it. That we can see some, some bits which are super yellowish, some bits which are um, darker, so, so which means that the complexity is, is higher. But there is nothing like super a smooth pattern. The same happens with, with elongation, actually. And we will see the same with convexity of tessellation cells. So this is these are our generate, generated tessellation cells, and linearity of, of street network. You can see that this very convoluted uh, segment has very uh, low linearity, while everything else is mostly composed of straight lines between intersections. So we can move on to a spatial distribution. Uh, one of the measurements we can do is a shared walls ratio of buildings, which means that we take the buildings and we look how, where they are and we measure how big portion of each uh, perimeter of each building is shared with its neighboring building. So if you have, if you have uh, single family housing, like we have, in area somewhere around here, if I remember correctly, the ratio is zero essentially because each building stands on its own. It doesn't share any uh, doesn't share any part of uh, of the perimeter with any other. But you can see that when you go to the central areas of uh, Znaimo in this case, there are some uh, places which. Uh, show that the shared walls ratio is higher and especially that especially happens within a relatively dense uh, uh, medieval city center but also what, what's funny is that you can see that the maximum value is 1.38 which is uh, essentially impossible to to reach within the normal clean data sets but it means again some overlaps between polygons because you can't share more than whole perimeter with other buildings. So that would also require a bit of cleaning if you want precise, precise result in here. And now we will employ lib Pycel into the, into the equations because what we are interested in is the, is how, uh, all those features, uh, which are, uh, which are illustrating our urban form are related to each other within space. So we use tessellation because tessellation is a contiguous, well, mostly contiguous, uh, <coughs> contiguous mesh of polygons. And we generate contiguity metrics uh, using LePaisal to encode uh, which polygons are next to which, which are its neighbors. So then we can use it within functions like MonPy neighbors, which in this case measures a weighted uh, number of neighbors of each isolation cell. So you take your cell, you look, okay, it uh, neighbors, let's say eight other cells, 
and its perimeter is 100 meters. So we weight it and we get the sense of granularity of place because more uh, neighbors with smaller perimeters means that the place is composed of very small pieces of land which are very densely packed together. While if you have few neighbors and if and especially if you have large uh, perimeters, it means that your uh, place is getting sparser and sparser. And we can also measure covered area by these neighbors around each tessellation cell. And we also can use it to measure distance to neighbors, to immediate neighbors. So we use the uh, contiguity metrics based on tessellation, but we will apply it to buildings because we know uh, that each building has its own tessellation cell because we have generated it as such. So we so this is spatial weights metrics is actually reusable. We can use it on tessellation, but also on buildings. But you can you may have noticed that I'm just catching some warnings here because this is come these are warnings coming from Pinterest and GIS. We can ignore that. It doesn't affect anything, but I just don't want hundred of, of warnings coming up in here. So we can measure these things and we can again look at them on the map. I should have started the execution bit while I was explaining apparently. So we will look into the neighbor distance, which will take the neighbor immediate neighbors of if each building based on the tessellation and measure how far they are, which is on the left side. And we will look into the covered area, which is the, the granularity met metric. So you can <coughs> you can see that in the city centers, uh, the distance is relatively small, while in the industrial area we're going further, further away. And I think that some other places, which are even sparsely populated, will will go towards larger numbers. And uh, the what is this covered area? As I mentioned, it's a measure of granularity. It will tell us how close the, 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 the place is formed uh, gives us some pockets in here. And since we are slightly running out of time, I will try to quickly go through the rest. We can also measure mean interbuilding distance within three topological steps along the same, along the same uh, white metrics. And we can also measure building adjacency, which means the tendency of buildings to actually be four packed together within a single block or standing aside. We can also use, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to skip the plotting because it takes a while and I need to finish the, the, the code. Uh, we can measure a street profile, we can measure width, we can deviation of width and openness based on buildings alongside each, each street segment. So you can start seeing that streets in the city center are much narrower than those which are in open open space which makes a lot of sense we can measure the density as i mentioned in here we measure a covered a covered area ratio so how big percentage of its tessellation cell is covered by a building and then we can go to connectivity i'm sorry for going going fast but we, we, we need to finish on time uh, what we have to do with uh, our student network is that we have to convert it to graph, which we, which we can do using very short and, and fast function in MumPy. Uh, it will give, give us a graph which is similar to OSM and X graph, but it's slightly different. And we measure node degree, we measure closeness centroid and meshedness. All three are related. Well, node degree is related to how many other uh, edges are coming to each intersection. Closeness, centroid, and meshedness are uh, expressing the connectivity of, of, of a place. Then we can convert it back from graph to uh, nodes and streets, geodata frames. If we want to plot what we have just measured, uh, we have the node degree in here. We have the local closeness in here. We can start seeing some, some pockets of mo more connected or less connected, less connected areas, and we have the measuredness, which gives us this sense: is it this grid or is it is it not a grid? 
and we will have to link everything, all this formation together. So we get the ID of, of each node, each nearest node based on the street segment to link, link it to building. And then we can link everything together. So we know we have the IDs, we have the shared IDs, and we can start from tessellation, uh, Jdata frame, which has the unique identifier, geometry, the identifier for node, for network, and the characters we have measured. And we can merge stuff from buildings based on unique identifier. We can merge uh, characters from streets based on unique identifiers. And we can measure uh, characters from nodes to get one large data frame with all the measured information in here. So we have quite a lot of columns in here. Uh, as you have seen, the information is linked to individual uh, individual desolation cells, but we are also interested in understanding the context. So we express uh, each of these uh, columns as three columns, measuring the first, second, and third quartile within uh, three topological steps, within the, its unique context around to get a sense of what is the tendency of, let's say, building area within, within a certain place, and what is the diversity of it, whether if, if the first, second, and third percent, third quartile are essentially the same, then we can say, okay, this place is pretty homogeneous. If there is a big difference between them and wide range of, of values, we can say, oh, this look at this. This place is very heterogeneous. There are small buildings next to large buildings. Uh, so we are using MonPy percentiles for every column apart from those which are not encoding uh, any measured character. There are some uh, warnings uh, about all uh, non slices. Uh, that should be fine. I think that's uh, related to. That should that's probably related to island uh, geometries and geometries which do not have neighbors. And those warnings we have we have seen uh, above uh, from uh, when we generated the tessellation. But it shouldn't it shouldn't worry you. It, it's normally normally okay. It doesn't have any any effect on the on the result, and I hope that it will be done soon. Yes, so we have the percentile, so we see the area of building is expressed as three different different values. And we also, before doing the clustering, we obviously need to standardize these values. So we just do mean standardization. In the meantime, uh, the plot has shown. So for example, the convexity, this is the convexity the plot we have seen above. A bit of noise in here. But when you express it as uh, the 50th percentile within the context, you start getting reasonable patterns. And this is what we use in the, in the clustering. So we have the standardized values in here. And now we can check, OK, how many clusters do we need? So uh, we are using clustergram, which is a diagram which uh, will fit the clustering for every option within the range of 1 and 12, which we have defined in here. And by default, it will use standard k-means clustering. And it will show us what the, uh, how the clusters are separated on based on based on the mean of, of clusters. So without going into detail of this of this diagram, we can see that uh, the widest spot, which still bears significant uh, uh, number of observations, is about seven clusters. And since uh, clustergram also sh stores all the labels, we can get the labels for seven classes and link it for seven classes and link it to our uh, geometries, which means that if you link it back to buildings, again, based on unique identifier, which is persistent, we can check whether our result gives us some urban types or whether it's going to be a lot of noise. And I would say that it looks pretty good considering that we have just picked 
a set of relatively random characters to give an illustration and the resulting clustering gives us pretty good uh, proxy of urban types. So we have the historical core in, in light blue. We have the development of, as I was saying, something around 1900s in orange. We have industrial zones. And we, 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 you see that it's, it's not perfect because you can't expect it from what we've done. And we have also the low, tiny buildings in here. That's probably the recreational area. And we have some urban type, which is present more in, in villages around. So I would say that that's pretty good result considering what we have done and how, how in, in the time we have done it. And that's all for me. Uh, if you wanna, if you're interested in more, you can check Mumpy documentation, which includes about, I think like 40, 50 different characters you can measure, maybe even a bit more. You can also get the notebook of a real life method which we used in a in a paper which is available on my github and it, it's, it's essentially the same same principle but it's slightly more convoluted more complex and it should give give you a nice result in the end and feel free to get in touch via email twitter linkedin whatever whatever you like and i think we have a few minutes for questions thank you Okay. Let... Alina, are, are, you, are you able to help me go through questions? Because there's yep, quite I can read you the question, <laughs> make your life a little bit easier. Thank you so much for that presentation, though. Um, in the true nature of the spatial data science community, people have been helping each other answer questions, and it's been really cool to see the collaboration while you've been presenting as well. All right. So we have a question from Iman in the chat. Can you explain a little more about the tessellation? Why is this better than using the building platform as is? Uh, the the point of using tessellation is that uh, we are trying to understand. For example, if we if we want to uh, measure density of built up area, you need to under you need to have buildings, which is the built part, and you have the area part. And since, since we don't have any area part by default coming from OpenStreetMap, we have to generate some kind of proxy. And urban morphology normally uses plots. So if we have plots, perfect, use plots, that's great. It will work, it will do, 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 do the, the good job. But if we don't have it, we just use morphological tessellation to kind of replace the role and get a bit more information. It's just an analytical, analytical feature. Gotcha. Um, you mentioned that MumPy was designed for urban areas. Where do you see the greatest need for adaptation slash the greatest restrictions for rural areas? Mm, no, it, 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 it's, it's been developed for uh, built up areas essentially. So we are using it mostly in urban environment, but it will work on rural environment as, as well. It, it, should, it should do the same, same job in there. Okay. Can you go a bit in depth on how to interpret this building analysis or where it could be applicable? Well, that could be another another, another talk. Uh, <laughs> how to interpret it? Uh, at the moment, you you can see, and you probably can't see, you, you could have seen the map of urban types. So let's say that your question is, uh, how does each urban type affect the quality of life in place? So you can use this as one of the input variables into, let's say, regression analysis. Or because we have the numerical values for each of them, you can profile them, you can understand, OK, what makes this place this place? And it can also be used in, in, in planning. So if you're interested in developing a new neighborhood, which looks like all the old one, you need to encode it. You need to understand what makes the old neighborhood look like this. So you can turn the, the, these values into the into planning code. And we can go on and go on. And I would suggest going to that to that paper, which should be probably linked in here. I'm not sure. Uh, but you, you will be able to Google it. Uh, because it, it goes into to, to the application as well. 
Awesome, thank you. And then for the case study you presented, is there any maximum coverage, perhaps in square meters per hectare? Uh, it's just limited by the power of your machine. We, we, we have applied this, this, this analysis on the whole Great Britain. It takes a bit more effort, but we have been able to, to scale it up to the whole country. Awesome. There is a lot of activity in the chat, so I believe we have time for at least one more question. Um, sorry, give me one moment. Do you think k-means clustering is very old and not compatible anymore? And it's also biased because we have to set the k points first. Why don't you use db scan, for example? Uh, k-means is criticized a lot, but we figure out that it's pretty uh, well suited for this task. We, uh, in the paper I, I linked, we have used Gaussian mixture model. Uh, I have experimented with B-Scan, but it didn't work as well as Gaussian mixture model or k-means. We've also experimented with uh, self-organizing maps and other, other things, but it turns out that k-means in the end is just good. It just does the job. That's what, what matters. All right. If it's not broke, don't fix it. So <laughs> yeah. um, I think that's all the time we have, but please feel free to connect with anyone in the chat.